We're pleased to be able to help welcome all of you to the 38th All India Cell Biology Conference. Sorry we can't be there. Uh, and we're making this video instead, in part to uh, answer some of the questions that Indian students sent us as part of a contest uh, for the best question. But each of us will select our own favorite uh, question and start to answer it, uh, and at the end we'll we'll tell you who the winner was. Andy. Oh, I'm Bruce Alberts, <laughs> the I'm oldest of the authors, which is why I get to speak first. And uh, I'm Sandy Johnson, and I'm Dave Morgan, the youngest of the authors. Yeah. So I'm sitting <laughs> last. <laughs> So one of the questions, uh, we found a lot of the questions very interesting, and one of the ones we want to discuss first is um, a question that goes, in the human body, is it only tissue stem cells that divide and replenish worn out cells, or do differentiated cells also undergo mitosis? And the answer to this question is that both of these things happen. So some differentiated tissues, like liver cells, uh, can regenerate on their own, whereas others, like neurons, um, have to come from stem cells. And the second part of the question is, if both of these happen, which, which is true, how is the choice made in a specific tissue type? So that's a very interesting question, um, one of the many that we don't know the answer to. Uh, it's probably, in essence, an evolutionary question. Um, how, did this, uh, how did these different kinds of uh, tissues uh, evolve? Um, but it's a very good question in the sense that we don't know the answer to it. Um, and so it's a, in that sense, it's a wonderful question. And um, I wish we had a better answer to that. But that's why it's a good question. And that's why we need uh, people like this to continue in cell biology, to ask these basic questions. I mean, the, part of the issue with this question, of course, is um, what is meant by terminally differentiated cells? The word terminal means the end. And so some would say that a terminally differentiated cell can go no further and can never divide again. And so in some ways it comes down to somewhat silly issues of what, uh, how we define these things. But it is clear that differentiated cells, some differentiated cells are capable of dividing again. And um, so those may not be terminally differentiated, but they're certainly differentiated. And then it's also very clear that some cells cannot divide, so neurons differentiated neurons cannot divide. And the way we replenish our brain cells, which we do in a couple of specific parts of the brain, is to, um, is to use stem cells for that. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen in all parts of the brain. <laughs> <laughs> and especially those of us who are getting older are unhappy about that. <laughs> David, do you want to pick up? Yeah, I have, a, I have a, a few. I thought there were uh, some very interesting questions here. One of my favorites was, um, uh, would life have evolved into its present form without the process of meiosis? Um, so meiosis, as you know, is this, uh, this remarkable process by which a diploid cell uh, distributes its chromosomes to create two haploid nuclei or haploid daughter nuclei. And so this is an absolutely crucial process in sexual reproduction. And sexual reproduction, as we know it, would not be possible without meiosis to produce the gametes that are then fused to create a, a diploid zygote. And so um, this is a, a really interesting question because like the previous one, it's also very difficult to answer um, why meiosis is so important and why sexual reproduction is so important. There are a lot of theories about why that might be the case, um, but those theories are very difficult to prove. So for example, many people would say that meiosis and sexual reproduction are important because they provide genetic diversity uh, that's not possible when you have asexual reproduction. Um, and I think that seems like a pretty likely explanation for the fact that the vast majority of the most complex species on, on Earth are uh, sexually reproducing and have, have become very diverse in form. But um, it can also be argued that a lot of very, uh, very dominant species on this planet, bacteria especially, uh, reproduce asexually and they're doing just fine as well. So uh, this is an interesting topic to get a, to, to get a lot of discussion started. Well, I'll pick a favorite question that I think we do know the answer answer to because uh, it, it really illuminates uh, something that's not very clear in 
textbooks, that is, how much we don't know, uh, although we've already emphasized a little bit of that. This, the question I'm going to address is from uh, Vijay at ICER in Bhopal, who asked, is it possible to manufacture a cell completely using chemicals, and can it be better than the present human cell? Well, the answer is clearly no today, and maybe no for at least another thousand years, because what we've all come to recognize, uh, as we've written this cell biology book through multiple editions, and as we've learned more and more about the chemistry of the cell, is how amazingly uh, elaborately sophisticated the chemistry is that makes us alive. Uh, and especially when you talk about human cells, which should not only be a self-reproducing living entity, but produce a human being through the process of embryogenesis. So we are far from knowing enough to even think about how we could improve the human species in, in any real way, uh, much less make something that's, that's, that's better. Uh, so we, <laughs> we, we, we took this uh, opportunity in writing a new edition of the textbook to add a new feature to this book because of the fact that when you write a textbook, you almost always confine yourself to what we do know. And students get the misguided impression that we know maybe 90 or 95 percent of what we need to know about cells. In fact, those of us who are authors would say maybe we know 5 percent, stretching it maybe 10 percent. There's a vast amount that we don't understand. It's easy to collect data about factual uh, you know, entities like how many different protein molecules and what their structures are today. We can collect vast amounts of data, but to really understand how those many chemicals interact to make a living cell and then much less a, a human being is it, just beyond our capability today. So we've added at the end of every chapter of our sixth edition of the molecular biology of the cell, a special set of, I think carefully thought out, <laughs> the authors all worked hard on this, what are some really important things that we don't know? And this is called What We Don't Know. And at the end of each chapter, there'll be maybe five or six of those. All very provocative uh, questions, really, that should guide future research. Okay, we announce the winner. Let's announce the winner. What did we think was the best question? Sandy, you want to tell us? Is Peter? Well, I think, um, I think we should go with a um, question about whether we can design better cells or not, um, which Bruce just um, um, attempted uh, but ultimately failed to answer. <laughs> um, because it's probably the most, one of the most op open-ended questions, and it really points out our relative ignorance of cell biology. Would you two agree with that? Fine with me. Totally. Okay. It says something that, that, you know, maybe in a thousand years we can give you a different answer. <laughs> it depends on some of you becoming uh, very innovative and creative scientists to help advance science forward, which is, of course, a very much a cooperative activity. It requires thousands of people building on each other's results. And we very much need all the talent we can get from all around the world. and especially from, from India. So it's a pleasure to be able to make this brief presentation today uh, to, to just describe a little bit about how we feel about cell biology. Yes, thank you very much.